right, okay. So um, the other thing is there's lots of pictures to be drawn, but I'm rubbish at pictures, so I'm not going to do very many pictures, okay? And I'm just going to go through the basics with you. Um, okay, so digestive system. Um, you do need to know, you need to be able to label the system. First of all, what, what does the digestive system do? It, it breaks down food, yeah. It breaks down food both mechanically and chemically through the use of enzymes, okay? And in terms of the system, it's pretty much like this. So you start, start with mouth, okay? You've also got salivary glands. They release, obviously, saliva. What, what do they contain inside them? Can you remember what enzyme? is in saliva. It starts with A. Amylase. Yeah, well done, amylase. So amylase is present in saliva glands. Well done. Okay, then it travels through the esophagus. Okay. Through the esophagus. And then to where? Where's the next part? Go to the stomach. Okay, so then to the stomach. So here you have another enzyme. You've got two things actually. So what enzyme? Well, you've got protease, which breaks down proteins. But there's another another chemical involved in the kind of breakdown, chemical breakdown. Can anyone remember what that is? Go on. It's acid, yeah, it's hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid, and that kills any pathogens as well. Okay, then it travels through the small intestine. So wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. So we'll go through the small intestine. Right, okay, so into the small intestine though, we have two things going on. We've got the pancreas, so um, the pancreas. Can anyone describe what the pancreas is? What is it? It's a gland, yeah. Okay, and it does produce all three enzymes, okay? So it produces amylase, lipase, and protease. Talk about those enzymes in a minute. Okay, you're also getting something else from the liver. Okay, so from the liver. And what chemical is that? Can anyone remember what chemical has been released? Well, it's made in the liver, released by the gallbladder. This is why we come to revision sessions. Bile, have you heard of bile? Okay, yeah, so bile. So gallbladder stores bile, but bile is not, it's not a, um, um, an enzyme. So bile does two things. It neutralizes acid in the stomach. So it neutralizes acid. It also, well, does, can anyone remember what else it does? No, it's such a long time since you revised this bit. Emulsifies fats or lipids, as we call them. So, what that does, what I mean by emulsify is you have large bits. These are this is a lipid, okay? And what happens is the emulsification doesn't break it down, it just forms it into smaller droplets which increases the surface area for the enzymes to break it down. There we go. Oh, crikey. And then, right, so wiggle, waggle, wiggle, waggle, wiggle, waggle, and we get to the large intestine. Yeah. 
what's happening there is water and minerals are absorbed. They're not absorbed in the diarrhea. Like that, like that drain. Um, and then finally, you go to rectum, which stores feces. I can never spell feces. F A E C E S. There you go. And finally, anus, which expels feces. Try to use the word feces in an exam. Okay. Right, so we need to talk about these guys here. So we're going to talk about amylase, protease, and lipase now. Right, so I'm going to do a nice little neat um, thing here. So I'm going to do a little thing. I'm going to say enzymes here. That's because you need to know where they're produced and what they do. Okay, so we'll go for amylase first. Or amylase, amylase, I call it. Right, I did say it's made of the salivary glands. So, salivary glands. It's also um, released from the pancreas and it's also released from the small intestine as well. So, three places. Right, the question is what does it, what's it catalyzing? What's it? breaking down what's it there's a whopping great insoluble molecule sorry starch. starch yeah so it breaks down starch which is a large insoluble mo molecule into glucose very good all done starch into glucose so i mean if i was to draw starch so starch is a whopping great big molecule made of lots and lots of glucose molecules okay and it takes a while for it all to be broken down into glucose so you have to start at salivary glands so it's quite hard to break down so that's that amylase let's go protease next So protease released by, um, well, again, stomach. Well, not again, actually, we haven't mentioned the stomach, but again, the pancreas and the small intestine again. So what's this breaking down then? Yeah. Breaking down proteins. Well done, so proteins into AAs or amino acids. Very good. Okay. And then finally, last one, we're going to look at lipase. Lipase, and that's released by the pancreas and small intestine again. So, in an exam, they can ask you where would they be released, and then what do they break break down? So, lipids obviously are broken down into two things. Anyone remember what they're broken down into? Anyone remember? No? Okay, fatty acids and glycerol. Fatty acids and glycerol.
Okay. In terms of how enzymes work, all right, so very, very briefly, so an enzyme, so in this case, here's the enzyme. And you have the substrate. Okay, so that's the substrate, what we call substrate. Can anyone remember what the, the kind of theory is? What's the, yes, yeah, the lock and key theory. So what happens is they collide, okay? So you get the enzyme and the substrate colliding. It's by chance that they collide. Well, not chance, it's by collision theory, but you don't need to know. Okay, so it forms what we call an enzyme substrate complex. Okay, and then it catalyzes the reaction. So um, enzymes are better known as biological catalysts. So what does a catalyst do? Yeah, it speeds up the reaction. Well done. It speeds up reactions. Good. So how does that do that? It's yeah, it lowers the activation energy of the reaction, but that's into A level biology. I think you might discuss it in chemistry about activation energies. Um, so what happens then is the substrate is then the bonds broken, so then it's broken down okay, into small molecules. So these are known as products. So these are the products. So very simply, if that was amylase, that would be starch, and at the end you would have glucose. Let's talk about there's two factors we need to think about, and I'm going to draw a graph. Okay, first one, rate reaction. I do apologize. Rate of reaction. And here is the temp degree C. Right, so in terms of how fast enzymes work, okay, you usually find at low temperatures, it's very, very slow. So, so as the temperature rises, it will increase, but then, ooh, then it will speed up to an optimum, and then if it gets too hot, the rate of reaction stops. So you can see the rate of reaction is increasing and then we reach what we call an optimum. And then any further in temperature, you get uh, the enzyme stops working. Can anyone remember about when the enzyme stops working, what do we call it? So enzyme is what? Yeah, good, the nature, remember that. Some students say they're killed. Well, they can't be killed because they're proteins. They're not alive in the first place. So they are denatured. So what I mean by denatured is very simple. It's just basically the active site. So if you imagine the active site is actually being deformed or has changed shape. Okay, so the active site changes shape. So therefore, substrate can no longer fit because the active site has been deformed or changed shape. So active site changes shape. I'll go over here as well. Active site changes shape. So you can guess in the digestive system. Um, in the digestive system, what do you think is the optimum temperature for the enzymes? Yeah, a um, bit less than that, be 37 degrees Celsius in a human. 
obviously it depends on 37.4 but um it will change from animal to animal good so that's temperature i'll do the second one up here which is actually ph so again rate of reaction r of r ph now the thing is you can get certain enzymes that love it when it's acidic okay and others that like it when it's alkaline okay so that's acidic that's alkaline so thinking about the digestive system which uh, enzymes do you think prefer kind of more acidic conditions yeah um, uh, yeah well done so that would be a protease very good and they've got very specific ph's they like whereas more alkaline conditions from seven to eight maybe okay well that's neutral but um lipase and amylase this explains why bile neutralizes acid so after the all the contents come out of the stomach they're very acidic acidic and they need to be neutralized acid needs to be neutralized so that these two enzymes can then start to work again okay so you get different enzymes now my dr b's top tip here okay is read the graph okay they will give you in the exam they will give you graph a graph and you'll have to describe and explain okay right describing graphs okay what does describing a graph mean so could somebody describe me this graph please someone describe this graph Nobody. Okay, I'll describe it. Okay, so uh, as temperature increases, the rate of re reaction increases. It becomes um, the rate of reaction increases um, up to, let's say, thirty-seven point four degrees, and then at, as the temperature increases from that point there, so thirty-seven to forty, let's say, the uh, rate of reaction decreases. So that's a description. What's an explanation of that graph? So how could we explain that graph? So what we could say is temperature increases. There are more collisions between the enzyme and substrate. Okay, so making more product. So increasing the rate of reaction up to an optimum. And then past that temperature, the enzyme is denatured. So the active site changes shape. Therefore, no further reactions can be catalyzed. So that would be an explanation. So they love to talk about descriptions, okay? Describe and explain. They love that kind of question. You always use their data, use the data, regardless of what data your teachers have told you, okay? If it says, I don't know, optimum temperature is 20 degrees C, or like 20 degrees C, as far as you're concerned, as far as that graph is concerned. So use that information. Don't, you know, if I've said it's 37, don't believe me, look at the graph. It is 37. Okay. Good. Right. So, oh, yes. Um, I shouldn't have called this organization in ours. I should have called it digestion because I just want to mention some required practicals. There are two required practicals here. The first one I'm going to talk about is food tests. Okay, so there we go. So sugars. Can anyone remember what reagent is used for sugars? Yeah. Yeah, Benedict's, well done. Very good. So Benedict's, 
solution or reagent. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the right colours here. Oh, should have thought about that. Hmm. Okay, well, it goes, Benedict's goes blue, and then actually you get colour change through yellow, green, orange, as you go through, but the main big one is red or brick red. So it goes red if sugars are present. Okay, that's Benedict's. What do you have to do to Benedict's to get the reaction to occur? Can you remember? Anyone remember? So glad you've come to this revision because it's obvious that if you're not getting it, the others won't get this. So you heat it. You have to heat it to 80 degrees. Heat to 80 degrees, probably in a water bath. Okay. Right. Uh, so that's sugars, like glucose, <laughs> proteins. Anyone remember? No, burette, use burette. And again, burette goes blue, but then it goes to purple or lilac. Okay, you've got the colors, that would be great. I haven't got the colors. Okay, so it goes from blue, purple to lilac if it is a positive test. And then the last test is to do with lipids or fats. And it's the emulsion test with ethanol and water. You use ethanol and water. So we're in a test tube and then it goes from colourless to a cloudy, to cloudy, cloudy emulsion. Yeah. Did that start from? Oh um, yes. Yeah, sorry. Well done. Very good. Excellent. So yeah, you can you can look at starch and you use iodine, and that goes if starch is present, it goes brown to blue black. Well done. So again, that's quite for that's quite good for when you do that photosynthesis. They do like to talk about as well about um, risk assessments. So I'll just mention about risk assessment. So risk assessments, you have to think about what the hazard is. Okay. You then need to think about um, how it could hurt you. So how it could harm you. And then finally, you need to think about um, how you reduce that hazard. You prevent it from hurting you. So reducing the hazard. Sir, yeah. Can I just ask that, sir? Yeah, of course you can. So I'll give you an example. Um, so if we're using chemicals, so the hazard are chemicals. So how could it harm you? Well, it could irritate the eyes. For example, irritate eyes or skin. Okay, and then how do you reduce the hazard? You wear safety goggles, or you wear. Um, you could wear, what, what else could you wear? Maybe gloves, or you could wash your hands if you get any chemicals. The other required practical, so the second RP2, very simply, is just looking at rates of reaction. Okay, 
So the common one they use is amylase and starch. And it's about measuring the rates of reaction or looking at the effects of different things like temperature or pH, for example. But to be honest, what I'm going to suggest you do is you go to my YouTube channel and there is a playlist, okay, with all, it's got all 10 required practicals for GCSE biology. But in this case, it's got this one, okay? Right, okay, so they need to know part structure. We need to know about um, things related to the part in terms of if things need replacing and stuff like that. Okay, so this, this is quite good. I am gonna draw a heart. I don't know whether you'll be able to draw it too. This is called a box heart. All right, so I'm just going to draw a very simple diagram. Probably wait till I've drawn it. Because I might make a mistake, sometimes do. So, oh dear, that valve's a bit leaky. Let's have that valve like that. Oh no, actually, why don't I do it in a different colour? There you go. Is it better? Still really bad, but there you go. There's valves up here, valve up here. This side is thicker. This this wall here is thicker. We'll talk about why in a minute. Hmm? This. Yeah. I can't draw a heart, so I've drawn a box heart. I can't draw a heart for you. You probably could. Right. I'm going to do some arrows showing the direction of blood flow. So blood flows through. Okay. So first of all, this side is the left side. I'll tell you why it's the left side, because that is my left. All right. It's how it is in your body. So that's the left. And that part there is the left ventricle. That's the bottom chamber. So on the opposite side, the same is the right ventricle. Okay, then here we have the left atrium. Here we have the right atrium. And then because you're doing GCSE biology higher tier, most of you, if not all of you, um, you need to, this one here. All right, okay, wait a minute. I'm just babbling on. Wait a second. This one's the aorta. That's the aorta there. Can anyone remember what is bringing oxygenated blood from the lungs? What's that one there? Does anyone remember? It is the pulmonary vein. Well done. So it's the pulmonary vein. Deary me. So that brings oxygenated blood. So the left side has oxygenated blood. From the lungs. And right side has deoxygenated blood being bring brought from the body. Okay, and this one here, so bringing deoxygenated blood. Now, deoxygenated blood is not blue, but I'm just doing it just to show you the differences. Okay, so you've got the vena cava. It's not a, not a cheap bottle of bubbly from Aldi. Sounds like it, but it isn't the vena cava. That's a joke. Vena carver. 
Uh, right, not a very good joke. And then the blood goes off to the lungs. So this is going to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. To lungs, pulmonary artery. There we go. Right, why is the left side thicker than the right side? Yeah. Yeah, so blood, so thicker muscle wall to pump blood around the body. So it needs to be under higher pressure. So it's under higher pressure. So pumps blood around the body. Good. Cool. Um, okay, so that's kind of the basic structure of the heart, but I want to talk a bit about well, what happens when something goes wrong, okay? So um, related to, let's talk about heart disease. Okay, so let's talk about coronary arteries first. So coronary artery, it supplies glucose and oxygen to the outside of the muscle. I mean, so if I, this is gonna be a terrible, this, this is the heart here, okay? And on the outside of the heart, all right, you've got blood vessels and these are coronary arteries, okay? Now, sometimes those coronary arteries can get blocked, all right? So they supply, we'll see what they do, supply glucose and oxygen to the cardiac muscle, because it is a muscle, for respiration to cardiac muscle. And sometimes what can happen is that if we were to look inside the blood vessel, what can happen is, so this is the kind of cross section. What can happen is you can start to get kind of blockages, okay, like that. So you get, um, well, so blood is flowing through here. So what it does is, it, one, it reduces blood flow, okay, and two, you get two, well, what else do you get? Well, it narrows, well, reduces blood flow, because, sorry, because it narrows the blood vessel. And two, reduces amounts of oxygen being supplied to the heart muscle. So can anyone remember what you can use to um, widen it or change it, yeah. Use yeah, you can use a stent. So you can use a stent. So stents are basically, um, they are, right, number one, they, they, you don't need open heart surgery, which is good. Why is it good to not have heart, open hearts, don't need heart? open surgery. Why is that a good thing? Why is it, sorry, I'll start again. Why is it good not to have open heart surgery? Less risk, yeah, less risk of infection, less risk of things going wrong. So what they do is they feed a, uh, they basically feed a little tube up through your crotch, yeah, usually your crotch, up into the heart, okay, and a stent is a, it's a wire mesh um, cylinder that keep the, is, keeps the artery open, keeps the vessel open. It's all important you really need to know, to be honest. More than likely, I'll be honest, they give you loads of information. 
in the exam. So you can use stents. What else can you use? So that's that's uh, kind of going in, but there are drugs. Does anyone know what types of drugs? Yeah, not blood thinners. Not blood thinners, no. Have you heard of statins? Yeah. So okay. statins, so you can have statins. So those are actual medicinal drugs that reduce cholesterol levels. Okay. So reduce cholesterol. Okay. Right, I'm just going to go on to valves just very briefly as well. Right, so sometimes the valve, what if a valve stops working um, or stops closing properly, what, what can happen? Yeah. Like backflow yeah. So the problem is, is you get backflow of blood. So you get backflow of blood, so less oxygen. So less oxygen. There's less oxygen being delivered to the cells in your body. What is there going to be a reduction of? What's the oxygen oxygen being used for? What process releases energy? Yeah. Respiration, yeah. So reduced aerobic respiration. Okay. Reduced aerobic respiration. So if, for example, you're doing exercise, it basically there's less muscle contractions, okay? And you basically have, you're tired, you might get a stitch, those kinds of things, okay? Right, so can anyone remember the types of valves you might have? Yeah. Good, so you might have a mechanical valve, okay? So mechanical, and you might have a biological valve. Now, we need to talk about advantages and disadvantages. So advantage, they love things related to advantages and disadvantages. Usually, again, in the exam, they'll give you lots of information. So they might say, use the information and your own knowledge, okay? So that means you can use bits that they've given you, but try and add some of your own stuff as well. So um, mechanical, well, big advantage. Um, well, is it a big advantage? Well, there's plenty of them, so there's no shortage. Okay, so no shortage. Um, any others? Yeah. Yeah, so no, yeah, so less waiting lists, that's what I meant, but no shortage really. Um, whereas the biological um, an advantage is, I don't know actually, what would an advantage be of biological? Hmm. Keeps you alive, I suppose. Hmm. Right. Okay. I, I'll tell you, well, keeps you alive. <laughs> so longer lifespan. Right. Big disadvantage of biological is that you need to take immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of your life. So immunosuppressant drugs. Do they last forever? So just about... No, they last usually for about 10 to 15 years. Um, oh, for well, mechanical can last longer, but there could there could be um, could be failures of the mechanical one. 
Also, you do need to have blood thinners because the mechanical can um, get blood clotting. Change blood clots. I'll be honest, you get loads of information in the exam on that. So I'm not going to dwell on that too, too much. I mean, you could go the whole hog as well. So heart disease, you could uh, go for um, an artificial heart. I don't, I don't know whether, I, did I show my group that yeah. guy that had the art, yeah, artificial He had a backpack, yeah. yeah. So he had a, a battery pack with him. Um, so yeah, it keeps you alive, but you can't live on an artificial heart. Definitely. Uh, right, okay. All right. I'm going to move on from there very quickly because we're running out of time, as always. So let me just do two more things. I'm going to do blood and blood vessels, all right? So very, very simple, and then we'll finish off. Okay, so first of all, blood. Very easy blood. So could you move from like 20 seconds, box and copy that on that? Oh, please. Oh, what's it say? Anyone name me parts of blood then and what they do? Sorry? No? It's not what I'm thinking of. That, that's part of where do you find hemoglobin? Red blood cells, yeah. Okay. So red blood cells. And they carry oxygen. Next one, white blood cells. And we know, well, we know that they're important for immunity. Okay, so destroying pathogens. Any others? Yeah, platelets. Thank you. We'll come to plasma in a minute. So platelets, they are parts of dead cells used for blood clotting. So if you get cut and things like that, so they can kind of clump up and then plasma. So plasma is the, it's a yellow uh, liquid. That, could, that basically is the, is the solution within which everything is suspended. So solution uh, suspends the parts and also gases and minerals and stuff. CO2 as well, suspended in it. It's dead easy. And then blood vessels. Okay, blood vessels. You might be, again, another top tip, you might be given pictures and you have to work out which one is which. Um, so again, I'm not very good at pictures. So um, the artery is quite a small lumen and it's got quite a thick elastic wall. So this is artery. So, So it's got thick layers, thick elastic layers. It's the arteries that carry the blood away from the heart. So they carry oxygenated blood on the heart. 
up from the pulmonary artery, away from the heart. So artery A away. Okay, they have to withstand high pressure. That's why they've got thick elastic layers and walls. Do veins next. Veins quite interesting because veins do have valves. Okay, so they have valves. Um, also, their structure, they tend to have a larger lumen in the middle. So, the lumen is much, much larger. It's got thinner walls. So, the main thing that it does is it carries blood to the heart into the heart, blood to the heart. Got thin walls, large lumen, which is the name for the hole, that's a lumen. Um, blood is at a lower pressure. They contain valves. Again, what do valves stop? And I think you, you said it before, contain valves to stop backflow. So what helps is your skeletal muscles. So skeletal muscles contract, moving the blood. So there is a bit of pressure, but also skeletal muscles contract to squeeze the veins. It's not the technical term, but never mind. And finally, don't like doing that, but I'm going to go down here. We've got capillaries. And they're dead simple. So capillaries are made up of one cell. So literally made up like this, but they've got little gaps in them. Okay, so that is one cell thick. No, that's very thin. So it allows exchange of materials. So like oxygen, so e.g. oxygen and CO2. Okay, it's got a very short, it's got a short diffusion pathway as well, short diffusion pathway. So for example, um, they surround all the alveoli in your lungs. And they're very thin, thin membranes means short diffusion pathway. Right, what's the one thing I haven't done that I'm not going to do tonight? Uh, it's lungs, so I haven't actually talked about lungs at all. So in the lungs, you just need to know about a bit about gas exchange. I think I mentioned lungs last week, I'm not too sure. Anyway, so lungs, you also need to know about Breathing, how you breathe, so breathing as well. But that's in animals. I haven't talked about plants, so I haven't talked about stomata, phloem, xylem, transpiration, translocation. So, but that's you got to remember this is a massive topic. Organization is a very big topic. Okay, if you want to take a picture, you can now.
Okay, I hope you found that useful. So that's organization in animals. Obviously, I need to do organization in plants. Um, but the basics are there. So I think my top tip really is to ensure, particularly for when you're talking about the heart, um, is using the information that they give you. So they will give you lots of information and, and they might say use this information and then your own information as well. So it's important to read the question carefully. Okay, I would use a highlighter. If you don't have a highlighter, they're very useful in an exam situation. Um, so yeah, that's one of my top tips. Anyway, so uh, I will see you soon. Take care and thanks for listening.